Uh, I would say that the, the process of transition is very haphazard in uh, North Korea, very uh, uh, with fits and starts, without a clear vision for the destination uh, and without a clear model, uh, be it China, Vietnam or Eastern Europe. And North Korea missed the boat in the early 90s when the Soviet Union collapsed and Eastern Europe embarked on, on a transition. But th this process of transition ha has been uh, with stops and goes. Uh, for example, in the late 2000s, uh, as we document in, in our paper, uh, Kim Jong-il tried to reverse marketization uh, because he worried about its political implications and, and control over, over the, the regime. And uh, he took measures to restrict the activity in markets. And then in 2009, uh, he went for a monetary reform, which was essentially confiscation and ended up uh, disastrously uh, with, with the effect of uh, spurring dollarization, or should I say, perhaps in the case of North Korea, yuanization. And uh, when Kim Jong-un replaced his father, uh, in late 2011, he gave his a new impetus to, to marketization uh, uh, and modernization. The sanctions have had an effect uh, uh, on trade flows. Some of the trade flows have clearly been affected. But these are trade flows measured by the mirror statistics. Um, these mirror statistics are the, the data that China produces. But of course, these data completely miss what is going on uh, in terms of smuggling. Uh, and there's a lot of smuggling across the border. So there are many ways uh, around the sanctions. Uh, and they're more and more overt. Uh, China apparently is no longer <laughs> Uh, as zealous uh, with respect to implementations of the UN sanctions. Uh, that said, uh, the sanctions do uh, hinder imports of critical inputs for industry and agriculture. Uh, we read reports, for example, of fertilizer plants that struggle because they can't get the inputs they need, which are imported inputs. Um, we also read about humanitarian efforts that are hampered by, by some of the sanctions, uh, even though in, in principle they should not be. So uh, you asked Randall whether sanctions, if they were uh, lifted, would unleash growth in North Korea. I would argue that it's a necessary condition, but not, not a sufficient one. Uh, corruption, red tape, coupled with the outsized resources spent on the military, uh, hold back economic development even more than, than the sanctions. Well, actually, Kesson, even Kesson was not really a success. Um, it was supposed to bring uh, together the comparative advantages of the two Koreas, with South Korea developing the land and power infrastructure, and its, its firms investing in, in the facilities, while well, North Korea provided low-wage workers. But uh, we, we should remember that it, it uh, really failed uh, uh, miserably if you look at the ambition uh, that uh, uh, underpin this project. The ambition was to have 2,000 enterprises and 350,000 workers. Uh, in the event, uh, the zone never had more than 125 enterprises and 55,000 workers. So it remained very small. Uh, and in fact, uh, its operations were interrupted several times. Uh, the, it was really difficult. Uh, so as you say, Randall, they have created quite a few other uh, zones, uh, notably uh, uh, connected to, to China, uh, even though those zones were mostly to facilitate industrial and technological catch up rather than uh, testing grounds for economic reforms. So by design, they were not quite as ambitious, ambitious as, as Kesum. And foreign partners have been reluctant to engage, uh, preferring to stick to trade uh, rather than uh, investment. Uh, why? Well, they just face too many uh, major obstacles. Uh, first of all, the rule of law uh, doesn't exist. Uh, it's rather the rule by law, I mean, in the sense of the law being used against you. Um, of course, wages and rents are low, but then foreign firms need to bear the cost of infrastructure development, and they face corruption uh, everywhere they look. Plus, there's the international sanctions and the uncertainty associated uh, with how they may evolve. Uh, and then, last but not least, there's a reputational uh, risk 
taken by, by firms who might go ahead. The chart shows clearly that the heavy industry collapsed completely uh, during the 1990s and never recovered. Light industry did a, did a little bit better, uh, recovered most of the lost ground, but even then uh, performance has been uh, mediocre. Uh, and then services uh, did better still, they actually grew, but they grew by less than 1% on average per annum over the past three decades. So, especially by Asian standards, and especially for an economy starting from such a low level, this is really a, a dismal record. Um, and yes, as long as resources go massively into the military, uh, it, it's hard to see uh, the industrial sector or the broader economy uh, take off uh, in earnest. A, a peace dividend could help spur economic development. That's, that's, that's true, especially if it comes as it would, uh, presumably, with the lifting of sanctions. Um, but as we discussed, uh, other conditions are crucial as well uh, to do with a legal framework for economic activity and the rule of law more generally. Um, electricity shortages are indeed a, a major and recurrent issue in, in North Korea. As the slide shows, uh, the generation of electricity by 2018 was 10% or so below the level in 1990, uh, even though the population grew in the meantime. Uh, and as the next slide shows, uh, you, you can see that uh, at nighttime, uh, most of North Korea remains a black hole, uh, especially compared to the, all the neons that illuminate uh, Seoul. Uh, electricity provision varies greatly across regions and power shortages are clearly much worse outside Pyongyang, but they even affect Pyongyang uh, and they affect the army and some core national defense uh, institutions uh, at times. So there's really, really a major problem there. And what is North Korea doing uh, to address it? Well, one avenue has been assistance from Big Brother China. Uh, uh, reports suggest that uh, recently installed Chinese generators supply around 40% of Pyongyang's power use, for example. And another avenue uh, is the development of alternative and greener energy sources. For example, the installation of small-scale solar panels in farms, nurseries, and so on. Uh, importantly, uh, there are now over 100,000 homes that have uh, solar equipment uh, on their roof. Uh, that would also be a way to uh, uh, address the problem of air pollution, which is very severe uh, in North Korea. Uh, of course, another avenue uh, would be to improve the energy efficiency of the industrial sector, which is uh, very poor, but this would require major investment, and uh, we have uh, discussed already what obstacles stand in the way of uh, uh, major investment. Uh, Um, the Donju uh, originally engaged in cross-border smuggling and, and they worked for the trading companies under the Workers' Party, the military and the government agencies that were involved in exporting raw materials and importing finished products from, from China mainly. So in that sense, yes, indeed, they, they initially built their wealth and influence um, based on the country's isolation and they accumulated a considerable capital and influence. Uh, with that, they've expanded their in markets uh, for consumer goods, for transport, distribution, uh, and importantly, as you mentioned, Randall, uh, for money lending. They, they act as private financiers for, for various business ventures. Uh, and they play also an important role in, in the circumvention of international sanctions, uh, to hark back to what we discussed earlier. They also run businesses within uh, the shell of state-owned enterprises, which is a very peculiar form of entrepreneurship, um, which a very few OECD countries uh, uh, know about. Um, I would underline that the government uh, sort of colludes with the Donju. Um, it can be to, to keep the price of rice stable. Uh, we just discussed uh, that. Or it can be to undertake complex projects that require money and international sourcing. The Donjus have also, as you alluded to, Randall, uh, been playing a big role in the real estate uh, development sector. Uh, maybe we can put up the, the slide that illustrates this. Uh, it's uh, 
uh, one of the large uh, uh, urban development projects, uh, the, one of the scientists' streets in Pyongyang, uh, and the Donju have been very instrumental in, in uh, the real estate boom that uh, saw these uh, uh, buildings uh, uh, across the skyline of Pyongyang uh, uh, in, in recent years. Uh, and then the Donju uh, get uh, sort of compensated for uh, the investment they, they make uh, by uh, getting a building usage rights after, after construction. They, they have used their, their clout to, to raise their, their influence and, and social status and advance their economic interests. And they, they receive medals and awards for their donations, which can serve as a mitigating factor when they are punished for legal activities. For me, uh, the Donju are, are very much uh, the North Korean hybrid economy's rent seekers. They, they contribute to and benefit from uh, a form of stability, uh, uh, but and they may not have a vested interest in, in uh, genuine regime change. So they may be an obstacle to, to genuine reform. Uh, 